Well, good afternoon, everyone from here in Los Angeles. I'm Sal Cardan, president of the Colburn School, and I'm joined on screen by Provost Adrian Daly. And on this day, when we celebrate and reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this Amplify Artists Roundtable discussion featuring three remarkable performing artists, educators, and creators. Colburn Community School alumna, composer and violist Nakatula Wenyama, Colburn Conservatory alumnus, composer, bassist, and band leader Marlon Martinez, and Colburn Trudel Zipper Dance Institute guest artist, choreographer, and dancer Silas Farley. As our nation, divided, continues to grapple with systemic racism, as well as great racial and socioeconomic disparity, brought even into starker relief by the pandemic gripping the world. It is vital that we, as a community of learners, performing artists, and educators, reflect on how we can individually and collectively advance the ideals and work of Dr. King. Dr. Daly. Thank you, Sal. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd also like to welcome all of you to our online seminar today in celebration of Martin Luther King Day here at the Colburn School. This really is such an important day for all of us for so many reasons, and perhaps now more than ever, I look forward to future celebrations in the years to come. As a school, this is an important opportunity for us to take some time each year in our busy lives to step back, reflect, and discuss issues that are meaningful to us and that hopefully can make the world a better place in the spirit of the ideals set forth by Dr. King. I also want to thank Nate Zeisler, Dean of Colburn Center for Innovation and Community Impact, for helping to organize this seminar with Michelle Yamamoto today. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Zeisler, who will continue our introductions and our guest artists today. So thank you very much. So Nate. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I look forward to hearing the, the discussion with our panelists in, in just a, a moment. I thought I'd take just a moment to give a quick overview of some of the developments that we've uh, been working on over the past semester uh, in light of rolling out our EDI initiatives last fall. Uh, first and foremost, we uh, are growing a partnership with ICOLA, Inner City Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles. And uh, many of you on this uh, call are, are uh, direct, your work has directly impacted that partnership. Uh, we have 18 students from the ICOLA uh, Orchestra studying with uh, Colburn Conservatory students. We have two students studying in the community school under full scholarship uh, under the auspices of our EDI initiatives. Uh, we've also announced a, a large partnerships with the uh, Sphinx organization, uh, which includes full scholarships for students who are semifinalists in the junior division of the Sphinx competition to study here in the academy, uh, our pre-college div uh, division of the institution. We also will be hosting the Sphinx Virtuosi next fall, as well as members of the Sphinx LEAD program, which is a, uh, a professional development program for em emerging arts administrators of color. Uh, we're also pleased to be launching the Fortissima program, which was, uh, has, is a program that's been growing over the last couple of years uh, under the leadership of Hasmin Morales. Uh, we will be launching a national version of this program in the fall and applications are uh, going to be open in the, in the next couple of weeks uh, for this program. Finally, I'm pleased to announce that today we are launching our social innovation grants. These are uh, grants for uh, in two areas. One area is the uh, an opportunity for you to work with emerging composers of color. Uh, we're, it's a commissioning project and a performance opportunity for students from across the institution. And the second is a community engagement grant designed for members of our Colburn community to serve members of the BIPOC community through education, service, or engagement. Be on the lookout for that application process to be live by the end of the week. And I look forward to your applications as they come in. Finally, I'm very thankful to have three of our four Amplify artists with us today for this panel discussion. 
And we will be launching uh, a number of residencies in the fall uh, with our Amplify artists. They'll be here for a week at a time over the course of the year. And each visit will include master classes, work with our student body, work in the community and performances on campus. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our panel, Nakatula Nunyama, Silas Farley and Marlon Martinez for a discussion. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Nate, Adrian, and Sel. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, my name is Nokatula Nguyenyama, uh, for those of you who may not know me. Um, and uh, I'm just so pleased and happy to be able to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, with, with the community and to talk about what we as Colburn's Amplify Artists have been up to. Um, just, I think, to start off the conversation, it would be nice to do something in uh, Dr. King's words himself. So I prepared um, a presentation of sorts that can kind of talk us through this. So I'm looking forward to speaking with Silas and Marlon shortly. His words. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny from his letter from Birmingham jail, one of my favorite documents. Again, his words, a lie cannot live. The limitation of riots, moral questions aside, is that they cannot win and their participants know it. It involves an emotional catharsis, but it must be followed by a sense of futility. So these recent events, I'm sure it's gotten Marlon and Silas thinking, but I've been doing a lot of research, looking at our history, and some numbers were slightly troubling. So. 24% of the US population was against the Union during the Civil War. And you can see how um, I got to this figure. So it was the 6 million versus 25 million. And we know what happened after the Civil War. So that's a small, that's a minority of the country. 29%, that was the national approval rating for the current president as of a few days ago. So that's actually a bigger number than the number who supported um, the Confederacy in the Civil War of, in terms of population. So I think that, that just those numbers are really, it makes me happy that we're having this conversation today because we can actually expose these numbers and say, okay, well, let's not be complacent. Let's be vigilant and stay the course. So again, in researching our talk for today, um, the following question came up. How was Jim Crow enacted following the end of Reconstruction with only 24% of the population dedicated to it? Um, I don't know if Marlon or Silas or anybody else wants to come in <laughs> and, and respond, but, um, but basically I was stunned with some of the research that I found and it was fake news. After the financial panic of 1873 and subsequent depression, Northerners had read so many accounts about whites being oppressed by Negro rule and corrupt politicians that they became believable. Goodwill was eroded and Jim Crow was allowed to take hold. So how do we combat the lies? And this is where I think uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy is really great and so wonderful to celebrate today. Through nonviolent resistance, um, and I call it otherwise known as resistance through excellence. And so this is something that I wrote up as artists, mentors, and administrators. It is our duty to speak truth to power through a common humanity and understanding of our history. We can practice love in our interactions every day through music, movement, intention, and speech. Continue to celebrate and welcome diversity in the classroom, concert hall, on stage, on the bookshelves, on the big screen, and in leadership. 
any and every step that we take together collectively in that direction is significant. So with that, let's get going to the Colburn Amplify Artist Roundtable. <laughs> Um, Silas, I want to just introduce both Silas and Marlon. They had an introduction, but wow, um, an incredible choreographer, dancer, and, and obviously making headlines. Um, movement is just so expressive. Um, I watched the premiere from the Met, um, and I was just blown away by the sensitivity and your movement, not just to music, but to words. Uh, so I'm looking forward to to speaking with you and also Marlon Martinez, whom many in the community know. Um, just, I, I, I loved hearing your videos and um, I loved hearing the ocean behind the Bach. Um, and so much of the jazz is just wonderful. You have such versatility. Um, and so I'm looking forward to answering some of these questions that have been posed by the community um, with you. So, uh, how about Silas, would you like to start off with our first question and uh, maybe talk about um, the legacy that MLK, mean, you know, what MLK's legacy means to you? Yeah, absolutely. What a pleasure to be with you all and thank you to the Colburn School for organizing this and to Nakutala for organizing our conversation and the opportunity for us to reflect today and to <clears throat> see where our present work fits into this continuum of beauty and art and justice and how they're so woven together. And I was doing a little bit of reading these past couple of days and listening to some of Dr. King's speeches and just wanted his words to be fresh in my mind. And um, I just want to read a line from the lecture that he gave at the University of Oslo around the time that he won the Nobel Prize. He said, deeply etched in the fiber of our religious tradition is the conviction that men are made in the image of God and that they are souls of infinite metaphysical value, the heirs of a legacy of dignity and worth. And everything that Dr. King was about flowed from that conviction of that ineffable spark that differentiates the human being from every other creature and his fierce advocacy for the dignity and the worth of every single person and his, his um, exhortation that we would all be honoring to every kind of person, every person in all that we pursue. And I know that in my art form of dance, there's a unique power because the essence of the whole enterprise is the human being and the human body. So there's that beautiful immediacy of the whole dance life that I think you know, flows from that same foundational conviction that Dr. King had of just the preciousness and worth of every single person. So that's where I would want to begin anything that I have to say today. Yeah, well, and, and already to go off topic for just a second, but do you find his words to be creatively inspiring? Because I, I, I just wonder if you go to them for that spark. You know, it's so interesting. I, I, I actually just went and I got a bunch of them because I realized I didn't have enough of his writing in my life. And just going back and reflecting in the, the rhythm of his writing, the poetry of his writing, the constant emphasis on the worth and dignity of every person in his writing. I mean, it's just, it's been moving to just dig into it more deeply, I think recently. So I would say that maybe in a way that it hasn't directly inspired my work in the past, that I imagine that the ballets that I make from this point forward will have more of his imprint on them, just as I've been marinating in his words freshly these past couple weeks. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And, and Marlon, um, Anything to add about uh, what Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, how it informs you as a person, as an artist? Yes, uh, well, I think ultimately, when I think of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I think about um, his calling in this life to celebrate the dignity of creation and the dignity of all peoples. Um, you know, and um, yes, his, his writings are, are eloquent, his passion was contagious, you know, and um, permeated the arts. Um, and it, it permeates in my mind, in my heart. Um, and um, yeah, when I think about Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and me, I think it's really, it really comes down to 
a call to action, uh, especially in this time. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I think it's kind of like all of us should, should be able to walk together and present our art and our creations uh, unbiased, without polarization, without negative stigmas and things like that, and just really present something that is pure beauty. Because I do believe that music is healing uh, and that all the fine arts is healing. It's all, all these roads and all these different avenues lead to one, th really one thing, which is love. And I think through love comes healing. Uh, and, you know, I really wish that, I really wish that more people today uh, could, could really respect one another equally, you know, uh, and um, this just really fuels my experimentation as a cross genre um, collaborator, um, you know, as a classical and jazz bassist and composer and all that, um, you know, I, I feel like it's just the best time to really dig deep into, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s call, you know. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And why don't you just start us off? So in that vein, what projects are you currently working on and, and how has the pandemic influenced those projects? Yeah, so uh, I have a, a few different projects uh, that I'm doing right now. Um, I'm currently transcribing uh, big band music by Billy Strayhorn, who is the composer that I'm exploring as an amplify artist this year. Um, so I'm digging into lesser known or forgotten pieces that I think are valuable and uh, would be amazing to hear today. Um, so this is music from the 1940s through the 1960s. And Billy Strayhorn was a close friend of Martin Luther King. And um, he, both of them together would collaborate. Uh, you know, Martin would give speeches uh, at fundraisers, raising awareness. Uh, and Strayhorn would be playing piano as background music. And also he would take part in, uh, you know, for the offerings to, to collect donations from people that believe in this true cause and Strayhorn would play the music. And That's so and I, I knew beautiful. nothing. Yeah, I knew nothing about this, you know, until I dug deeper into Strayhorn's life. Uh, so, so many of the, the jazz legends, uh, musicians kind of look at them for what they did with music. But I feel like that's an incomplete picture. You have to really go back beyond, oh, this recording sounds old. Oh, their performance practice is a little outdated to what we do. Or like, oh, this innovation didn't happen back then. You know, and all these, we can, we can really view this artist in musical ways. But then when you go back into time and read his story, you find out his friend was <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Like, wow. And he would, they would, he would see him off when he would go fly to do the, the historic things that he did, you know? And so it's kind of interesting that this is all happening right now on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And so I'm, I'm, I'm transcribing Strayhorn, trying to bring awareness of him uh, as a composer, as a person. Um, I kind of see Strayhorn as like a, he, he could really be a 21st century artist, you know, but he was really trying to do so much in his time. Um, and, you know, he faced uh, racism, homophobia, loss of credit, loss of recognition. Uh, I mean, just so many things. Um, so yeah, transcription is one of the things I'm doing. Um, I'm also selecting uh, Strayhorn compositions to perform with my big band, uh, Marlonius Jazz Orchestra. Uh, we were we were established here. And now how do you guys rehearse in these times? Yeah, in these times, uh, well, mostly at this stage, we're doing mainly phone calls, just conversations, discussions about how we're going to perform Strayhorn's music. Uh, who needs to be involved to do this, um, how we're going to eventually record our, uh, the big band's debut album, which will uh, be kind of like a mix of Strayhorn compositions, as well as my own original compositions. Um, but we're in the planning stages right now. Um, uh, a lot of musicians today are doing, you know, virtual uh, sessions, virtual big band projects, virtual string quartet, you name it, all those things. And, um, you know, I just did a session the other day um, in an ISO booth, you know, and, and everything is just remote for now. But yeah, the pandemic is good in a sense that it gives me a lot of time to 
plan how to do this, how to execute this uh, project. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds that sounds wonderful. It sounds like you're staying busy and in the moment, which is which is um, which is definitely engaging. <laughs> Silas, I know that you're up to a lot as well, and. Um, I could see you smiling as Marlon was talking. I could almost see you thinking about, wow, what would that, how would that feel in the body? You know, that music that was played to Martin Luther King's words. So what, what projects are you currently working on now? Yeah, I'll kind of work backwards talking about them because my Amplify artist role will continue on into next year as, as will be for all of us. And Marlon really gave me my marching orders without realizing it for what I'm going to do during my time, because part of his idea was to take a few of Billy Strayhorn's compositions and have them choreographed. And so that was brought to me as a potential dimension of what I might do. And when I was listening to these pieces, Tonk, Valse, Water, Sprite, and Strange Feeling, I absolutely was like, this is a ballet. So Marlon gave me my, my marching orders. And I'm so excited. I've been listening to the pieces really intently in these past couple of days. And my father is a musician. So we had a long conversation because um, jazz has not been a, a realm of music that I've gotten to collaborate much with through my journey as a ballet dancer. So I was on the phone with dad and I was like, dad, tell me everything about Billy Strayhorn. So we had a long conversation recently and I was just watching the Independent Lens PBS documentary on him. So as you were saying those dimensions of his story, his work with Dr. King and with Lena Horne and civil rights, it was just, it's all very fresh in my mind. And I'm very excited about bringing these particular compositions to life choreographically. And one of them that got me particularly excited was this valse, which Strayhorn wrote while he was a teenager. He wrote it for the Orchestral Club at Westinghouse High in Pittsburgh. And it just got me excited thinking, you know, here we are, we'll have these teenage dancers dancing to a piece that Strayhorn wrote as a teenager. And uh, all of the latent brilliant, not even latent brilliance. I mean, there it all was from, his, from the very beginning. You so uniquely with him. That's what I've been learning. As, and so I, I'm just thankful to Marlon. He's given me a new, a new person to, to guide me artistically and creatively. So it's beautiful. <laughs> Gosh, well, and isn't this one of the most wonderful things about having a round table discussion and being able to collaborate in this way and find projects that we can all do and that bring us all together. So this that's right. fabulous. Um, my projects are not as, uh, I mean, they're collaborative, but not with either Marlon or Silas yet. Um, so <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I, I will be um, writing a piece that is going to be premiered um, in Mar of February of 22. And it's going to be my first string quartet, but for violin, viola, cello, and bass. So I've been hearing some, you know, bass tones in that. And so there are some challenges though to writing a quartet like that, but I'm, I'm up for it. So I'm excited for that. And um, then we'll be doing some a, a master class, and then during the residency, I'll also do some teaching uh, in person and outreach. And then we'll be working online uh, with some seminars between now and and then. So it's a lot of stuff um, that I'll be doing with the, the students and the faculty and the administration at Colburn. I'm looking very much forward to it. So, all right, here we have question number two. Oh, we kind of already answered that, did we not? <laughs> um, and and there, the, that was the list that I was looking for. So I was able to, to, to put out what I will be doing. So I'm looking forward to that and to seeing everybody in the Colburn community. So, all right, I think Silas, why don't you start with this one? Mm -hmm. How would you like to see our field and our, your, your field of dance, my field of music, but the field of dance evolve in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, I think so much within the field of dance, I spend so much time thinking about classical ballet specifically, because that's my first love. It's where I've become the person that I am, thanks to this beautiful art form of classical ballet. And so I think my, my answer will really flow from that. And a lot of it, a lot of my hopes have to do with more equitable access to really strong classical ballet training. 
and then adding the study of the history of dance, the history of ballet very specifically, and its relationship to the other arts, making that a more integral part of the education of young dancers. Because as a dancer steps into the classroom, that person enters into a whole world of ideas and art that is so beyond first position and fifth and bat matandu and plie that they'll spend all those years perfecting. But my hope is for dancers to really learn from a young age how by participating in this particular art form, they enter into that whole world of art that um, is so beyond them, but that they get the privilege of getting to be a part of, that they're part of this great continuum. And there was a 19th century Danish ballet master, August Bornenville, who said, every dancer ought to regard their laborious art as a link in the chain of beauty. And I love that. And, and thinking about the dancers who came before and this, this, this historically transcendent community of people whose lives have been shaped by the same artistic discipline. And I have a, a friend and mentor who calls it like knowing who your ancestors are, the people that came before you. And I think we, we have the equivalent of that with the great violists of the past and Marlon with all the bassists who came before you in classical music and jazz music. But so that dancers would really feel that they're part of that rich heritage. And another, I guess one of the last things I'd say that I really hope to see develop is again, related to the education of dancers. And that has to do with developing the young dancer as a collaborative agent and not as a silent technician. I feel so much dance training is about schooling the body with the dancer as an almost blank slate who's being programmed as opposed to this being a, as, as, as Dr. King would say, as this precious image bearer who needs to be engaged as a collaborative agent in their process of development and transformation. So I know for so many dancers, the movement itself is their voice. And so to give them the space to develop that and to encourage them to use their actual voice too. I know, I know part of that has been clarified to me even through teaching ballet on Zoom. And when, I, when I've taught ballet in the past, wow. I oftentimes try to leave time at the end of the lesson to ask the students, what did you, what is one thing that you learned today? So that this, these dancers in this silent enterprise get us a moment to speak and say, today I learned how fifth position is the cornerstone of my whole technique or something like that. But I feel like that those moments have become even more powerful over Zoom because the dancer is literally muted the entire class on Zoom. And so they get this moment where their voice is heard and their voice is part of the rhythm of the class. And so finding ways, because if you develop a dancer like that, then when, when those dancers grow up into companies or they become teachers or directors, they will hopefully have a spirit that is so open and generous and willing to engage with other people, willing to stand up when things are unjust and how an organization is being run, but to be able to do that in a winsome way because their actual voice was cultivated along with their physical voice too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it looks like, I mean, it, I think that there's a lot of the training in music that's similar to that. It's like, learn how to do all of these things, but it's not necessarily like, well, how do you feel about that as an artist, <laughs> right? Like, it's, it's more like, we don't have time, like we've got to learn all this stuff and so let's learn it. But I think that for lasting power, and in, in any in any field, having that conscious learning and okay, so what are you doing and connection, um, artistic connection to the drudgery is is really important. Yeah, Marlon, what about you? How how do you see our field evolving in the coming years, or what would you like to see? Yes, a lot of what uh, Silas was talking about, um, and to add to that, really, uh, you know, just just to keep this this going, this idea, you know, of um, you know, really embracing oneself and what you do as a part of, and like what all the different things that you're learning as something that uh, all, all these things are kind of within oneself, you know, and it, it's, someone told me that it's not like you have to find your voice, you are your voice. And so you need to now take all the things that you're learning, all the different mediums, and to be able to see your voice through 
all that stuff you're doing and it's going to enhance your voice. It's, it's this interesting kind of um, giving and receiving going on. Uh, I, I think I made a tangent a little bit there, but but I would like to see a lot of uh, more, more, like much more cross collaboration, just collaboration with dance, with, uh, you know, uh, music, everything uh, in in the, the upcoming years. Um, well, it seems so natural to you. It's not like I don't I, when I hear you play in different genres of music, I hear your musical voice. I don't hear like this huge shift like oh where did marlin go or something <laughs> between your performances it's your voice in that medium and it feels very natural to it's pliable um and that's something you know that i feel too with music and expression that it's pliable it crosses over great music crosses over all genres, all genres. so and and so the musician is able to to do that and it's really it shouldn't be that big of a deal and I think it's becoming less of a deal. I think most people are crossing over um, and especially now people are at home and and kind of having to to grow as artists. They're not just, you know, trying to to race and and cram for the next gig or something like that. They're not necessarily being told what to do. They have to do what it is they want to do. Right. Yeah. So so I think that when um, things open up, artists will have evolved a lot in this period. Yeah, it's a lot of, it's a time uh, of uh, soul searching. Um, and, you know, there was a, a time period at the very end of 2020, uh, where I, I kind of hit a roadblock, you know, and, and I was also having writer's block, and I was kind of going through this whole thing, and um, a lot of uh, self-criticism and I stepped back and after a break I came back and said what what do I really like about music what brought me into music in the first place what music what genres what about the bass there are a lot of opinions and methodologies uh, and just certain ideals that exist even within institutions uh, that uh, can maybe you know all of it's good all of it I think is good in moderation though. I think there, it, there comes a point where a young artist, an upcoming artist needs to be able to be free to express themselves through different mediums, through different types of collaborations, through different genres, through other ways of playing the instrument. Um, and these are things that I've really wrestled um, in the freelance world in New York and over here in LA and just trying different things. Uh, so I would like to kind of see um, Again, uh, more cross collaboration, and also I'd like to see more uh, performance spaces. I, I, you know, obviously everyone's struggling to come back, and businesses to run again. But you know, uh, with so many venues closing uh, on all, you know, everywhere, it's it's kind of like there's so many of us that have so much to say, and 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 so much that needs to be heard, but not enough platforms to really do it other than the virtual medium right now and um in you know i'd like to see a comeback you know of, of live presentations live performances yeah. i i think it will come i think that it can't grow until it's safer for people to be out and about outdoors you know True. Yeah. But it will it will come, I think, similar to the roaring 20s that came after the the great, you know, the Spanish flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to come. It's just right now. This is what it is. So yeah. we have to we're, we're forced to kind of evolve and and reflect and and um, consider lots of different things right now. But I, I think that's it's a blessing, you know, as long as we stay well, it's a blessing. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, oh, oh, yeah, Silas, sorry, you want to say something? As you, as you were talking about just the, the gift that COVID has given us insofar as it's given us time to reflect. I hear Marlon saying the same thing, time to really think about why did we get into these disciplines? Like what, what's the meaning of our music? Why are we doing what we're doing? And I was reading an interview with Dr. King from 1965, and he was at the height and in the thick of all of his different work. And he was so overwhelmed and he had no time. And the interviewer asked him, what do you really need? And he said, 
I need time out from the mechanics of the movement to think about the meaning of the movement. Wow. And I thought, is that not what COVID has given all of us in some way? It's given us time out from the mechanics of the next gig and the next rehearsal and the next performance and the next whatever to think about the meaning. So with all of its blows, that's definitely a gift that COVID has given us. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, this is Michelle. I'm sorry, I just wanna jump in really quick. We've had a few requests to um, end the screen share just so that everybody can see the speakers a little bit more clearly. If oh, that's okay excuse with you. me, I'm so sorry about that. Yes, Thank I you. can do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was taking up all of that space. So I apologize to you guys. So, all right, I, I can ask these questions. Not, not everyone has to see them, but um, who do you feel is doing interesting work that, that you'd like to share their work with the with the Colburn community now? Is there, are there people that, that we should know about that you're, you guys are collaborating with that, that we'd like to know about? Uh, if I could speak first. Um, yeah, it's funny, actually, my mentor, uh, Stanley Clark, a uh, great bassist, um, he and composer and producer, he's actually released a series on YouTube called Bass Nation. Uh, where he interviews artists, young and old, and uh, from different fields of music and discusses um, artistry, the search for oneself, how to be a professional, you know, um, being open-minded to change and being open-minded to, you know, embrace other things in music and dance. I'm sure he'll get to that. Um, and he and I are in discussions to do things with the bass and uh, other things. Check them out. Stanley Clark, Bass Nation. Uh, obviously sounds like it's for just bass players, but I, I find it very interesting. Uh, he, he interviewed a, a tabla master and they talked about the origins of the, the instrument and the Indian classical music and all the styles and like the history behind it. And then they started jamming and it was beautiful. I was like, man, this is, <laughs> this stuff is eye-opening for, uh, for so many people who might not have seen that combination of musical styles intertwining so yeah recommend that to just for starters oh and silas that sounds great and silas i don't know if you if you have any people or any projects or ideas to be recommending um but it looks like um oh it, uh, there's duffy's has written some questions did you see them in the chat silas let me see um, I believe Marlon has collaborated with dancers before with performances featuring the double bass and a concurrent interpretive dance performance. Is that something Silas is interested in pursuing? Absolutely. <laughs> Yay. I'd be keen to collaborate with, with Marlon in, in this kind of a piece. That'd be great. And I, and I imagine that you know perhaps with some of the, the work we'll be doing over the next year with Amplify Artists that we'll have the opportunity to make that happen too. Which is yeah, I'm realizing, I'm realizing, wait a second, here's something really beautiful. We could, we need to get together and discuss this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've comp composed music uh, with a great dancer, a uh, friend of mine, Emily Chamberlain, mm -hmm. who has the Emily, Emily Chamberlain uh, Dance Collective in New York. And we kind of started it together. And I wrote a piece for her. We performed it around New York City and just various places, theaters, and then like jazz clubs. And so the choreography and the interaction between both of us changes, obviously, according to the space and to the, the kind of uh, viewers. So that's something, something maybe <laughs> in that vein we can go for in our own way. Oh, I love it. So, and, and in terms of, um, just people who are doing interesting um, work right now. I came up with a list of people. Um, Daniel Bernard Romain, he's violinist, composer, activist. He's doing wonderful, interesting, compelling work. Um, and you also have Amadi Azikiwe, who teaches at NYU, and Stephen Banks, who's a wonderful saxophonist and composer. 
um, Valerie Coleman Page, who's also a composer, flautist, and um, Xavier Foley, who's a bass player as well, and um, the Imani Winds, who are in the African American Museum of the Smithsonian. They have an incredible exhibit there. They're just fabulous group has been, been giving to the community, wonderful composers, many of them in their own right as well. And Althea Waits, who is in town in LA, uh, down in Long Beach for many, many years, big champion of Florence Price, whom we'll be hearing in just a little bit. Uh, she is in LA and playing and um, educating and the list goes on and and these names are by no means exhaustive. So I do have that list and I can send it to the school or to anybody who's interested if you like. Um, but uh, there are so many people who are working and, and, and in, in very engaging um, and humanistic projects, expressive projects that we really should be paying attention to. Indeed. So those were the last questions that we got. Um, I'm wondering whether or not we open up uh, questions to um, any listeners who are on. Well, I don't see anybody coming in, but Silas, I'll, I'm happy to talk about, oh, Sel, did you have a question? Well, I thought Tula, you could, first of all, I just want to say this was just, it's been a fascinating discussion and um, it, we, as wonderful as this is, we can't wait to have you all on campus physically next year and, you know, this kind of conversation and, and collaboration to continue. And also our fourth Amplify artist who couldn't join us today, principal bassoonist of the Atlanta Symphony, Andrew Brady, who's a recent graduate of Colburn, will be uh, uh, joining us on campus next year. So lots to look forward to. But Tula, I thought... Uh, maybe you could tell us if you're agreeable about the composition that you're working on right now, because I'm, I, I've just been so taken by uh, what you've uh, um, put together and, and sort of the process and so forth. So, Yeah, I'm working on uh, Finding the Dream, which I actually finished writing uh, last summer, uh, and it's inspired by uh, Martin Luther King. I have a dream speech and the George Floyd murder and Black Lives Matter movement from last summer. Um, I like so many people um, around the world uh, just felt emotionally, morally, spiritually gutted um, when the eight minutes and 46 seconds of Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck aired. Um, it was an enough is enough kind of moment for me, um, but it's not just George Floyd. Um, it's Rashad Brooks, it's Elijah McClain, it's Breonna Taylor, um, Eric Garner, <laughs> and the list goes on and, and on. And um, as a musician, as a composer, um, as artists, I feel that it's our duty to express uh, what needs to be expressed in the moment. And so finding the dream just kind of found me in that moment. And um, the words came first. Um, and then the music came and then I realized um, actually after watching School of Rock because we have to find our levity through these moments too that I needed to form a band with my kids and we needed to find the dream together. So I wrote parts for them and uh, we've basically been playing, practicing them and then recording them. And so they're all in the can and I'm putting the last final touches on it. Um, and then the Phoenix Boys Choir was interested in being a part of the project. And my son is a singer and sings with the Phoenix Boys Choir. So um, they, they recorded their parts. And so Finding the Dream is, it's coming soon. <laughs> Um, but it's for shaker, uh, piano, 
violin, viola, cello, uh, voice, um, cajon, uh, and uh, choir, Phoenix Boys Choir. So that was how I could take the emotions and the, uh, the moral imperative to do something, to bring the protest to the concert hall and to, to, make, to, to, to have people listen. And, and, and the piece is eight minutes and 46 seconds long. So that was really important to me because when in that eight minutes and 46 seconds is someone gonna figure out that this is the wrong way to be? Eight minutes and 46 seconds is a long time to make a decision. So that is what Finding the Dream is about and I'm working on that, but I'm also writing a violin piece for Bela Ristova and um, uh, this, this quartet is coming down the pike for, for Colburn. And I also have a piano quartet that I will be writing and will be premiering with the Couchstein Laredo Robinson Trio in later in 2022. So, um, wow, you are, you are, you are really busy. And I know we look forward to sharing, finding the dream with the Colburn community when, when it's ready, we really, Thank I know you. looking forward to that. And the other thing I will just say is that, you know, Nakatula represents such an important link to Colburn history. Um, she knew Dr. Herbert Zipper uh, very well and, and played. She was my counterpoint teacher <laughs> so, and conductor. <laughs> I don't know if you'd want to say something about the spirit that he, he brought uh, to music and the remarkable educator that he was. Oh, absolutely. Well, going through all of this, um, I've thought so much about Dr. Zipper. In fact, I think about him every day um, when I'm in the score, when I'm out of the score, and um, actually talked to Warren Spaeth, who, who uh, did teach at Colburn for many years and who uh, would teach um, or taught with Dr. Zipper for my theory and counterpoint. Um, and uh, Dr. Zipper was someone who would say, never give up, don't ever give up. So um, there's that. I mean, it, he, I, he would not have us sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. He would have us standing up and fighting injustice. And for that, it meant bringing music into the schools as early as possible, before third grade, if possible, because he believed that once the children get older, those walls start to go up and it's hard to have the abstract expression of music come through unfiltered to the heart. And because that's what ends up moving and changing and softening people so that these, uh, you know, these, this, it, it, it brings people, again, I'll use a Warren, a Warrenism. <laughs> it brings people away from a binary way of thinking and into a more complex way of thinking and feeling and experiencing the world. So he lived that, but he was also a creature of habit. And so going through the pandemic, thinking about his habits of having his really hot, well, not super hot, not burnt, of course, not not burnt, but espresso uh, that was thick, like almost like a molasses. And I don't know how he drank that, but he did. And then he would do his counterpoint every day, every morning. I, that work ethic, oh, and he loved his wife, Trudel. I never met her. He was a widower by the time I met with her, but he loved her and he loved all motion and movement and dance and expression. So Silas, that you're there, um, you know, it, it, in a position that bears her name is unbelievable. I mean, that, it's very moving when I heard that announced. So um, he would want us to not give up and to move forward with dignity and to continue to share and express and get out there and uh, make the world a better place. Thanks for sharing that, Tula. And uh, in fact, Silas, you're giving a class, would we say February 12th for the Trudel Zipper Dance Institute, a virtual class. Uh, so that's something I know our students are going to be looking forward to and our whole community. And again, thank all of you so much. It was a really inspiring conversation. And I look forward to seeing 
everyone in person soon. And I guess, Tula, are you going to announce the work that we're about to hear? Yes, um, we are going to be listening to the Viano Quartet performing Florence Price's String Quartet in G major, second movement, Andante Moderato and Allegro, Allegretto, excuse me. Um, and I just want to say thank you to um, my fellow Amplify artists who are here, Marlon and Silas. It's just wonderful to get to meet you and speak. And I hope you don't mind if I reach out to you on the side after our conversation here today, because you guys are both amazing. Um, and also to everyone at the Colburn School, Sal Carden, Adrian Daly, Nate Zeisler, Christine Tanabe, and Michelle Yamamoto. It has been my honor moderating today's roundtable discussion.